Good morning. Welcome to the Digging Deep Bible Study. So glad that you're with us today. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Today we're doing Acts 17. It's part three in Acts 17. Our third week in this same chapter. We're going to try to do verses 10 through 15 today. Let's start with a word of prayer like we do each week. If you'll repeat this simple prayer, basically what I'm asking you to do is to pray and ask the Lord to speak to you and change your heart. So if you'd like, repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I believe in the power of your word to change my life. Make me more like you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in our study of Acts, we pick up the story with Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. They're on Paul's second missionary journey, and they're in the city of Berea. It's in modern-day Greece. So thank you for being here with today. Let's read the text, Acts 17, 10 through 15, if you want to follow along. It says, That very night, the believers sent Paul and Silas to Berea. When they arrived there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. As a result, many Jews believed, as did many of the prominent Greek women and men. But when some Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea, they went there and stirred up trouble. The believers acted at once, sending Paul onto the coast while Silas and Timothy remained behind there in Berea. Those escorting Paul went with him all the way to Athens, and then they returned to Berea with instructions for Silas and Timothy to hurry and join them. Okay, we see once again in that first verse, verse 10, that Paul goes to the synagogue. So why does he go to the synagogue? We've covered that a lot. This is Paul's pattern, right? He goes to the synagogue because he goes to the Jew first, right? But this week, I wanna add one more reason why he went to the synagogue that I hadn't thought about. Um, the reason he went to the synagogue also was because that's where the scriptures were. That's where the copies of the scripture were. You know, he didn't probably carry around a physical copy of the whole Old Testament, right? He might have had some um, scrolls or some parchment. You know, in one of his letters he says, ask, I didn't look it up, what, who is it, Timothy or somebody like that to bring my scrolls and parchments. So he might have had certain little pieces of the scriptures with him. But he didn't have a Bible with him like y'all do to uh, carry around and open up. The Bible was there at the synagogue. That's where they did the scriptures. When you think about it, people have only had personal copies of the Bible for the last 400 years, right? Since the printing press, I guess, right? Since Gutenberg or whatever. So it's interesting that that they had to get together. I love that. It being like the life group pastor, you know, the small groups, the Bible studies, that's what I'm all about. I love that they had to get together to study the Bible together in community. And their societies existed more with a sense of community, right? So that was a positive thing. They would get together, read the word of God together and uh, hear from uh, the rabbis, hear from a visiting rabbi like Paul coming through and all of that. It's kind of good that they got to get, had to get together like that. Um, and, you know, of course, that's, a, that's just lobbing up the plug for, you know, get in a group, study the Bible with some other believers, right? It's important for us still today. But we've only had personal copies of the Bible for about 400 years. Do we know our Bibles better now than they did? I mean, how, how many of you have more than one Bible at home, right? Yeah, right? We, we have more than one. We have... Even on our phone, we can open up, you know, 40 different English translations or whatever and look at the Bible. But we might not, I don't think we know our Bibles better than they did sometimes, right? So how did they do it if they didn't have their own copy with them? Well, they memorized it, right? They memorized it. They sang it. They chanted it. They did whatever it took to, like, repeatedly get it into their hearts and minds. That, that's something that we should learn of. Have you heard of these people before, the Bereans? You may have heard of the Bereans. They get highlighted a little bit because it says, right here in the text, it says they were of more noble character, that they eagerly studied the scriptures. They studied it day by day to see if what Paul was teaching was true. So we kind of can hold them up as a model. So you might have heard of them before. Our leadership and ministry school that we have here at the church, we have one, by the way, if you didn't know, we have a leadership and ministry school where people can go just to, to get a leadership certificate, but also if they want to go into the ministry, possibly, they can get certified uh, as a uh, minister and 
they actually can go all the way and become ordained in our denomination. But the, the university that we're connected to is called Global University, and the specific school at Global University that, uh, that we're a part of is called the Berean School of the Bible, and it's after these Bereans that we have right here in Acts chapter 17 because of how they eagerly received the Word of God and how they studied it day by day to see if what Paul was teaching was true. And there's another verse that you may have heard of that we quote a lot of when we talk about studying the Bible. It's the verse in 2 Timothy 2.15. It says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We use that verse a lot, right? You'll hear that in church. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a battle cry of the church is that verse gets shared a lot. Study to show thyself approved unto God. If we're advertising uh, Bible studies or you'll hear Pastor Randy quote that verse a lot. Study to show yourself. Because Pastor Randy, if you notice, he is oftentimes encouraging you to be reading your Bible, do your devotions, all that. When we're here in staff meetings, we have staff meetings right here in this same room, and he's encouraging us all the time to be in our devotions, to pray in the Spirit, you know, to keep yourself humble and teachable. He's always uh, challenging us, I guess, to be like the Brians, which is what it is. But when you think about our story that we're going through here in the book of Acts, he's here with the Brians, and he's here with Timothy, and this is the first trip that Timothy's with Paul on. So maybe this is where Timothy learned this principle firsthand. This is where Timothy saw it live in action. He saw these people actually doing it. And then later on, Paul writes him a letter in the book of 2 Timothy and, and reminds him of that principle. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, like the Bereans, he could have said, right? So that's okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're getting online with it. Share it out. That's right. If you're watching online, share it out and help us spread the word. Um, next, I want to talk, I want to use this moment where we're highlighting the Bereans to talk about studying the Bible, right? And just a few little basics. I'm not going to go as in-depth as I could. We could spend a six-week series on how to study your Bible, right? But just a few little things that I wanted to point out. And I've covered this at other times, so these are a little bit different. So don't think this is exhaustive of how to study your Bible, but maybe these are just some little highlights to throw out there for you this week and maybe you could use. First thing is that Bible reading is different from Bible study. We need to read the Bible regularly and hear it. And, and that is one advantage of having it like on our phones. I'll just have the Bible, I'll have it read it to me, right? You can just press play and it'll read it to you. That way if you're not a strong reader or something like that, you can have it read to you. Or if you're more of an auditory learner like I am, I just love hearing the word. But Bible reading and Bible study are different. Here's an analogy for you. Bible reading is more like raking, and Bible study is more like digging, right? You can kind of rake across the surface with Bible reading, but uh, Bible study is like digging. But that's what, y'all are here for digging deep. So y'all are here. Y'all are really like the Bereans, right? So can, good for you. You're here going deeper in God's word. So we need both. We need to read the word, but we also need to dig deep and study. Uh, another thing about how to study the Bible, a second thing might would be to ask questions to know the author's meaning. And the author's meaning, his original meaning, is going to be God's meaning, right? It's going to be what God intended to put in there. So ask questions, be discerning, so that you know the author's original meaning. And then another little tip would be, <clears throat> a third thing, would be to ask questions about the words in the text, even the little tiny words. You know, we can study the big words that are in there and, and get the big concept, but also there's little conjunctions sometimes. And sometimes those little conjunctions connect to statements. And you know how this statement relates to another statement, or you see how those connections are made all throughout the scripture. As you look at it in other passages, you start making connections. Um, recently in this class, we talked about um, suffering and trials and hardships and the purpose of that, right? We've had to go look at that. I think that was last week, right? <laughs> so, but you can look at those little tiny conjunction words sometimes and you'll realize when you study suffering in the Bible that almost always the word glory is connected. You'll find glory in the context around that. So going through his suffering, it's like participating in the fellowship of his sufferings. We get to participate in his glory. So you can find certain little themes like that if you're looking at the tiny words, not just the big picture words. And then another thing I want to say about studying the Bible, the digging part of it, is it's kind of like studying any other topic, right? Don't think of it as like this mysterious thing. It's like studying any other topic. My son Sam, 
He's in the back back there, but he is a studier. He is a learner. He, I mean, all his life from uh, young, he was, when the iPhones, he's an iPhone kid, right? He's like the same age as the iPod, I think, or something like that. So he's always known everything about phones. Everybody just hands him their phone and he fixes their phone, you know? And he's always known everything about Lionel trains. You know, he loves the Lionel trains and he sets up the train, he set up the train display over in the kids building this year at Christmas time. He's always studying whatever the topic is, but he's a learner. And um, some kids are on their phones all the time to play games or for pleasure. He's on there learning something all the time, and I just love that about him. So it's like studying any topic, really. It's, well, now it's motor, I wrote, now he's studying motorcycles and how to fix motorcycles and stuff. But he's just learning stuff all the time. That's the way, that's like being like a Berean. So it's, Bible study is like studying any other topic, but what is different about Bible study that maybe is a little different than any other topic, and that is the spiritual warfare that's involved also, right? We cannot neglect the spiritual warfare aspect of it. There is an enemy that doesn't want you, that just tries to veil your mind, that tries to work against you, that tries to lie to you about it, to tell you you don't need it, it doesn't matter, that kind of thing. So pray at the beginning pray during and pray at the end of your Bible study. Pray for revelation, pray for wisdom, pray for understanding so that the Lord will open your mind to his truth. Just like we do at the beginning of this study. We pray and ask the Lord to change us and open our minds to his truth. And then my last, I think this is my last suge suggestion under this section, would be to, like the Brians, study with an eagerness of mind. That's what was different about them, was they studied with an eagerness of mind to know the truth. They didn't study with an agenda. That was what's different about them. They study, when you look at the word, like Acts 17, 11, it says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. That word eagerness in the Greek, it means promptness, readiness, eagerness of mind, and willingness. All of that is in that one Greek word. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. That's what was different about them is that they received the word and they studied the word with eagerness. So maybe that's your application today. That's what you want to put into your life. That's what you want to ask God to do for you is, Lord, make me somebody who studies the word with eagerness like that. Because I started thinking about it, the, the Thessalonians, right, that they had, just, they had just run Paul out of town. They even came down to Berea when they found out he was preaching down there and stirred up trouble again. They heard Paul. They listened to Paul. If we compare the Thessalonians who heard the word and rejected it and we, to the Bereans who heard it and examined it and looked at it and, for a, and then we compare it to the people in Athens that we're about to study later in this chapter. What's different about the Thessalonians, the Bereans, and the Athenians? We're not comparing people who didn't come and hear the message. We're not saying, how do we get them to come and hear the message? With all three, the Thessalonians, they came and heard it, but then they stirred up trouble and ran them out of town, right? The Bereans came and heard it, but they examined it with eagerness to see if it was the truth. The Athenians... What did they do? We haven't even gotten to that yet in Acts 17, but I'll just give you a little preview. What, they were eager to hear it, right? The Athenians were known for just sitting around all day studying philosophy. They sat up on Mars Hill, and they, were all, they had a god for everything, right? They had little g gods, but, you know, they had gods for everything. There were thousands of gods. So they studied, right? They were eager to hear. Our, the word we're focused on here is eagerness. I'm encouraging you to have eagerness to study God's word. But the Athenians, they were eager what was the difference about the Bereans? The difference with the Bereans was they were studying it, checking it out, but without an agenda. And, because I see, I think the Thessalonians had an agenda. They received it and studied it, but the Thessalonians said, no, that doesn't match up. Jesus can't be the Messiah because they had an agenda. They were hanging on to their legalism, to their old Jewish ways and all that kind of stuff. So this new guy, Paul, they had to reject him because it didn't fit their agenda of how they studied God's word. You may not know it, but you might have an agenda about how you study God's word, right? You figured out your, your theology and you have an agenda, especially if you're a ministry student, David, you got to be careful. <laughs> uh, when you're in seminary, though, 
seminary students love to sit around and debate and argue and all this kind of stuff, right? And they get all their theology down and everything. And even if you're in a certain denomination or a certain, you grew up a certain way, right? You have an agenda. And then as you study the Bible, you can be eager and study the Bible every day, but you're studying it to find your own agenda. And that's not what we want to do. We don't want to study God's word and find our agenda that we already have. We want to study God's word with eagerness and find what he would say to us. God, you may be old like me and, um, and been studying the word for a long time and you find something brand new in the word that kind of shakes your theology a little bit, but that's okay because you're studying with eagerness. But see, what's different about the Brians was they did have a moral standard. They did have the Old Testament prophets that they were comparing it to. The Athenians, they were just philosophizing. They were studying it and examining it and they were receiving it, but they didn't have any moral standard to compare it to. They didn't have, so we gotta have, we gotta be like the Bereans and study it with eagerness and be open-minded, but not so open-minded like the Athenians that would, then they just accept the new, next thing that comes along. What, how would we compare the Athenians to people today, right? That'd be more like maybe, new age teaching or whatever, right? Just there's, um, I don't want to bash other religions too much, but there are some, you know, those new age Eastern religions that they, everything's just new and um, I don't know. It's a little too open-minded, right? So my encouragement to do is to be eager to study the word, not with an agenda, but to compare it to God's word that is true and tested. Now, the next section for, I have for you here is some suggested resources. So I put them on a little strip of paper there, on the table, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. We can just kind of zoom through this a little bit. You can take that with you, stick it in your Bible, and look at those later. Um, we're going to try to um, put that a picture of those resources on the line. So if you're watching online, we're going to try to drop a little picture in there. If not, you can email me, and I'll uh, send it to you. But suggested resources. I looked... These are just the ones I was looking at and recommending this week. I could give you, you know, like three pages of resources of how to study the Bible. But this week I found this How to Read the Bible by Tim Mackey and the Bible Project. It's on Right Now Media or it's on YouTube. And these are little five-minute videos. And they teach you how to read the Bible. They teach you about the origin, content, and purpose of different sections of the Bible. So little five-minute videos videos are easy to digest. They have 19 of those five minute videos. So man, you can really go deep, but I, I really enjoyed that and really help you, especially if you're new to the God's word, how to read the Bible and check that out with Bible project. The next resource I have there for is called survey of the Bible. We've done this. The Jinkersons did this in their life group survey of the Bible. It's by Bruce Wilkinson. It goes through the old Testament books, places, story, and people in periods. And then it goes through the New Testament, books, places, story, people, and periods, and lays it all out for you. And he's a master teacher. So he's going over it, going over it, going over it, and he's laying it down in layers, and he really can help you have an overall survey to look at God's word so that you can dig and not just rake across the top, right? So that way when you're studying it and reading it, you have more hooks to hang things on, right? It's kind of like if you get these big ideas down as you survey the Bible, then you have places to put things. So I'd encourage and recommend that to you to dig deep on your own. Another resource we're using in our life groups and we're asking life groups to do is a study called Seamless. It's called Understanding the Bible as One Complete Story with Angie Smith. And uh, she was a new believer and was just bewildered by the, by the Bible. It was just so overwhelming for her to look at it. So she is really uh, studied and done go to job for the brand new person to look at the whole Bible. I think it's only like a six week study. Is that right? And uh, she looks at but it, that would be a good place to start also if you're brand new to studying God's Word. And then a book that um, Pastor Darla and Jesse, our worship pastor and myself, are reading right now is called How to Worship a King by Zach Neese. And this is an uh, advanced worship book if you would like to get into it. He goes through, you know, why we worship and the importance of worship and all, lays it out in the introductory. But then he gets real deep and goes into the tabernacle and all the pieces of the tabernacle and how they relate to worship today. And it is a deep, good study. I'm just now getting into the pieces in the tabernacle, several chapters in, and I'm really looking forward to that. And I'll bring up worship in a minute. The reason I'm putting the worship resources is because something I'm about to share with you in a minute. So stay tuned for that. Here's kind of my big question that I got to. All of that that I've said so far is kind of to say this. <laughs> so if you need to tune back in, tune back in right here, okay? 
what I was just reflecting on as I was looking at this with the Bereans, I started thinking about us and trying to apply that. I said, why do some people hunger for God's word and other people don't? Like y'all are here and y'all are hungry and ready, but we have, you know, 3,000 more people <laughs> that attend our church every month that aren't in here right now. So why do some people hunger for God and others don't? And so I put down a few reasons and I'm going to chase a few little rabbits with this, but let's have fun with this a little bit. Um, okay, one reason, first reason I guess I would say why some people listen, some don't, is bec what made the Bereans different. It's kind of what I've already shared, so I'm going to just say it again real quickly, but what the difference between the Thessalonians and the Brian and the Athenians is that some people study the word and they study it without an agenda, but they compare it and have a standard to go through. So just insert all that I said about the Thessalonians, Brian's, and put that right here. I kind of skipped ahead, gave you that one already. A second reason why some people hunger for God's word, some people are ready to study it and others aren't. I think one thing that makes the difference is that we've forgotten the importance of confessing our sins. And I kind of hinted at this last week, but I think this is something that God's showing me and showing my wife Misty and she's speaking it into me and I'm trying to take it in. She's a, a licensed counselor, a Christian counselor. And she said, it feels like in the church today at large, not just our church, but that we've kind of lost the concept of confessing our sins and the importance of that. You might not even know what I'm trying to say about confessing our sins, but let me give it to you with the word because that's the way we're supposed to examine this, right? Is the word says in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? Or to cleanse us from all wickedness. That's what confessing our sins does. It cleanses us from that unrighteousness. So if we're not confessing our sins, this isn't like salvation and getting saved and born again the first time. We need to get born again and be a new person in Christ Jesus, right? But then we also need to confess our sins. I think daily we need to confess our sins and to be cleansed. It creates a, a uh, more open relationship if we're walking around, if you visualize it like we're walking around with all this unrighteousness on us, right? I, I feel for our students in the schools, right? Our students in school walking through some filth, right? They walk through a lot of negativity, a lot of vulgar things, a lot of uh, unrighteousness, to say the least, right? A lot of kids grow up in that in their homes, right? And now they're home for the summer, we're, we're, we're starting summer, and they're around that even more. Or they're being abused, or they're being whatever, neglected, or whatever it might be. It breaks your heart, right? Oh, I don't know how I got off on that. But confessing our sins. So if this is your application, if the, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about this, or you want to know more about this, ask him to show you what this is. And to do it, just a quick how-to, would be to imagine yourself in a courtroom. Imagine yourself going before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, because he is going before him. So you go into his presence with thanksgiving. You go into his presence with praise. You go into his presence humbly. So go into that courtroom. I'm trying to do that visually myself. It's just a attitude more than anything else. I'm trying to do that myself in my own times of prayer, is to see it like a courtroom, because then I have to humble myself and go there. And then... What is hard is that you have to go to that courtroom and realize that you're guilty. <laughs> I don't ever walk into the courtroom before the King of Kings and I'm not guilty. A lot of people walk in the courtroom and say they're not guilty, right? Like in our courtrooms here. <laughs> if, you, if you met me, Ed, you do prison ministry. There's a lot of uh, innocent people, right, in prison, yeah. So they didn't do it, right? But we go in the courtroom, we're guilty, right? But the thing that is so beautiful about it is that we have an advocate, right? We have Jesus there to pay the penalty for our sin. But we have to go and confess our sins and uh, ask the Lord Jesus to cleanse us. So I'd encourage you to do that. I think doing that regularly, having that kind of humility, having that kind of cleansing before the Lord keeps us hungry, keeps us um, close to him, and then we'll be more like the Brians and be ready and eager to receive the word of God. Another reason why we 
are not hungry for God sometimes is because we don't operate out of our identity. We don't operate out of our identity. Let me say it like this. It's a broken view of yourself to operate out of your function or possibly even your gifting. Have you heard this before? It's another way to say it. We are human beings, not human doings, right? We're human beings, not human doings. But a lot of times we operate out of what we do and we operate on a performance-based system. We don't operate out of grace. So my challenge for you today is to operate out of your identity. You see, God doesn't use you as a tool. We say the phrase, I want God to use me. How many of you would say, I want God to use me? We'd say, yes, I want God to use me, right? But if we said, do you want your wife to use you or your spouse to use you? Do you want your friend to use you? Do you want your boss to use you? It becomes negative, right? We don't want to be people to use us, but we say we want God to use us. And I think we have a little bit of a warped sense of that sometimes. Because see, God doesn't use us like a tool. And then if the tool breaks or the tool gets rusty or the tool is not sharp anymore, then God just puts us over and doesn't use us anymore. It's not like that. We don't, he doesn't grade on our performance. You see, God used Pharaoh, but he knew Moses. You see the difference? God used Saul. And Saul even prophesied one time, right? God used Saul, but God knew David. And God used Judas even, right? To fulfill the purpose of, but he knew Jesus. Jesus is God. Here's one of the most sobering verses in the Bible. is Matthew 7, 21. It says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, listen to this, they were used. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and we performed many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you, right? So we need to know God and operate out of our identity Okay, I'm going to have to skip the next little story. I was going to tell you the story of the sons of Sceva. If you haven't read the sons of Sceva story, it's in Acts 19 and we'll get there anyway. We're in 17 now. We'll get to Acts 19 uh, pretty soon. So we'll cover that story later on. But back to our identity. We need to know our identity and then operate of our identity. That's what I've been preaching at you right now, right? Know your identity. Know your identity. Don't do it out of just what you do. Do it out of who you are. But what is your identity? You see, these Bereans, they were of noble character. They had uh, an identity like that. But what is our identity? Our identity is that we're a child of God. Our identity is that we're a friend of God. Our identity is that we're more than a conqueror. And we start to know these things about ourselves, then we need to confess those things. We need to confess our sin. We talked about that earlier, but we also need to confess who we are in Christ and operate out of our identity. We're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We're a priest. We're a royal nation in a kingdom of priests. That's our identity. So if we operate out of our identity, it's only gonna make us more hungry to know the truth and to know God. Now, I told you earlier that I was gonna talk about worship a little bit. I have a couple of minutes maybe. Um, I wish I had more time to talk about praise and worship. There's a difference between praise and worship. And I think the reason I'm bringing this up is because if we were people who worshiped more and worshiped more personally and even, even in our private time and then worshiped more like we really engaged in the community worship in the church service, it would cause us to be more like the Bereans and more hungry and more spiritually sen sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That worship, see we can praise our boss we can praise our spouse right we can praise our friends or our kids I praise my kids a lot right don't get me talking about my you know we'll, we can praise the, our grandkids right I don't have any of those yet but 
we praise things like that, but worship is an attitude of the heart. And worship is what we do with God. And you're gonna be worshiping something. You're created to worship something, right? You're either worshiping food, <laughs> or you're worshiping pleasure, or you're worshiping yourself. But we're created to worship God. And that means that we have to humble ourselves, submit ourselves, have a different posture for worship. So maybe dig deep on that on your own and uh, ask the Lord, what would it mean to worship? So your applications may be several different things. As we close this out, your application may be several different things. It may be to focus on confession. It may be to focus on worship and the heart attitude of that. It'd be to focus on knowing God, not just be used by God, but to know God. Pharaoh was used by God, Moses knew God, right? I want you to think about this week. I hope those things land and stick with you this week. Um, I don't know, what is your application? As we close out, ask the Lord to, ask the Holy Spirit, I mean, literally right there where you're sitting, ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what your application is and ask the Lord to make you more like the Bereans, to be open-minded, to eagerly study the Word of God, to work on your, your character, to work on your soul to receive. So do that as we close and as I lead us in prayer. But ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Heavenly Father, we worship you together right now. We bless your name. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you that your ways are right and true and good. That you're a good father and you give good gifts to your children. Thank you that we are children of God. We're friends of God. I pray that we would know you. I pray that we would know our identity pray that blessing over each person that's here. I pray that we would be worshipers and that we would know what that means and we would do it in private and in public. We would seek you out. I pray you would make us hungry for your word and that we would uh, be like the Bereans and, and study it every day and uh, really examine the scripture and eagerly receive it into our lives. I pray that for this group, everyone watching online and over our whole church, that we just create the, a fire, a, a hunger for your truth and for your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.